Welcome to Afikra's Quarter Tones. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on the series, I am welcomed with uh, welcoming Ghalia, who is a Syrian singer, songwriter, composer, record player, and multi instrumentalist. Uh, Ghalia, welcome to Afikra. Hi, thanks for having me, Mikey. So I'm reading your bio, and it says, by the age of six, Ghalia had already fallen in love with three different instruments drums, guitar, and piano. In what order did that happen? Um, well, it just took me back to when I would come back from school and then I'd find all kinds of, kinds of instruments at home, in my bedroom especially. Uh, I feel like my dad was was obsessed with music, that he wanted me to sort of make his dream come true. Mm. And he would be very persistent on bringing a new instrument every single, you know, every other day for me to learn something new. And then my mom spotted, uh, you know, I think she spotted my talent. Um, I coming to these talent shows at school. Uh, that's when I started singing, playing on the guitar. Um, but in what order? I think it started with um, the tambourine. That was the first instrument I ever laid hands on. And like, and then and express your yeah. talent on the tambourine. Yeah, like like I would just like start playing the tambourine in, in such weird ways, and then you know make it be. Interesting. I mean, yeah. G- give us context. So this is in where is this? Is in Dubai or where? That was back in Alain, actually. It's a it's a it's like a countryside of Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a, a very small town, not geographically. There's like four hundred thousand people, but it's uh, it's the countryside. That's what we call it here. That's where I grew up. Interesting. Does, does that is that like part of? Do you feel like that's like part of your? your musical identity has sort of been shaped by that that feature of growing up in the the countryside of the UAE, which is not a yeah, sentence people I, I typically think, so. think of. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, growing up in Alain, I think that kind of adds that flavor to, you know, or headlines, this girl coming from a small town or whatever. I mean, despite the fact that I actually originally... I am from a, from a big city, Damascus in Syria, but growing up here has really, I feel like has really shaped my career because it's such a multicultural uh, place to live in and you meet different people every day. So it really doesn't matter where you live. And uh, it just influences my, you know, my taste in music and how I make music at the studio. It's crazy. So yeah, let's say, I mean, do you feel young? Uh, yeah. Should I, should I, should I feel like I'm getting old? <laughs> My wife, like when I see you, you come across as like a, I'm like, oh, this is a young person. Right. But then I'm like, maybe yeah. you don't feel young. Maybe I'm like labeling you in this way. That is not how you feel. I mean, for me, I'm like, this is a very young person who is extreme. I'll tell you why I ask you this. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> yeah. the, the reason why I ask you this question is because I was going to say, you know, when you were younger, what did you like? Hmm. Um, what did you really like listening to? But usually when I ask artists this question, I'm usually usually suggesting to them to remember back to the age <laughs> that you probably are now. Yeah, I guess. Um, no, I, I totally understand. But it's what's funny is that I grew up listening to something completely different from what what my parents listened to, what, what my siblings yeah. listened to. I'm the, I'm the youngest, by the way. And there's like eight years difference um, in between. But the thing is, Outside the house, and, um, I grew up on, you know, those movies and TV shows and English music, especially country. So when people hear that story, they're like, why the hell would you listen to country music? And I'm like, well, that's where I learned songwriting from. It's so storytelling in a way where you can literally write about anything. It's a skill. And so growing up, listening to country music, hanging out at the desert with my friends around bonfires, it's just the way you, I grew up, the lifestyle, you know, the kind of school I went to, the friends I had. The stuff I consumed as a kid, uh, it wasn't cartoon and, and, and that stuff. You know, it was going somewhere that has an open mic as a teenager and just chilling with friends and watching people sing or doing poetry or whatever it is on the microphone. Um, I don't know, comedy even. Um, I think it's it's that way I was brought up. I don't usually, I mean, I'd love to give credit to, credit to my parents, but I do now. But... I wouldn't give them credit for how I, you know, how I was, I was brought up because they had nothing to do with that part. 
I think it's the environment. Again, it's the it's the place I grew up in. You know, it's not the household per se. So you're saying you like country. Like, who, who did you listen to? If I ran into the, like the 15 year old version of you, who did I listen to? Who did you listen to? I mean, you'd still see playlists of Blake Shelton, um, Sam Hart. You'd see a lot. Um, I don't know, like uh, such old folks, you know, bluegrass, a lot of bluegrass for some reason. God knows why. I was into that weird stuff. Um, and again, the songwriting really had me. It was very expressive for me, uh, especially that I, you know, like you said, I started playing different instruments. And there wasn't a way for me to be able to express how I feel in on paper. Mm -hmm. And country music really taught me how to do that. So interesting. Yeah. So like... Did you start writing country songs? Is, I mean, usually people write those types of songs that they listen to. Were you listening? Were you like, did you have a twang? Did you? <laughs> of course. Of course I did, Mike. I actually experimented uh, when I moved to Dubai. I met a couple of uh, producers that were into the country so much and rock music. And I'm like, you know, guys, I want to release a country song. Hmm. And they're like, like, piss off. Like, what are you talking about? Like, mm -hmm. nobody consumes that stuff anymore. It's not even popular culture, you know, quote unquote. Yeah. I said, you know what? No, I want to do it. I love it so much. That was way before any of those hits came out. Way before that. That was like five years ago. I think that was 19 or 20, yeah. six years ago. I started, I started at 19. And I did it. I released a song with a friend of mine. We went to the studio and we called it The Boy in Town. Very typical country title. <laughs> You're going and by the saloon? Was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the truck and whatever, the cigarettes, uh, yeah. you know, hair slipped back, white t-shirts, all that kind of stuff. And it was lovely. It was actually featured on uh, top 10 uh, Nashville list in, the, in Mina on Apple Music. How funny. How yeah. <laughs> So at what point did you like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to switch it up. Ah, uh, that's a very complicated phase for me because, um, I also wanted to do Arabic music. I just didn't know how or where to start from. Okay. I had to go back to, to, I honestly went back to, you know, I'd like sit with my grandmas and my grandpa. I'd sit like with my parents, my dad, especially because he grew up listening to very, you know, dark oriental music type of type of thing and i would just listen to i just like try to consume as much as i can mm -hmm. um and ask a lot about the history of arabic music and so funny like everything worked out the same like at the same time uh god sent me this manager his name's andreas i'd like to say hi to him like shout out um I met this guy and he's like, you know what? People love your voice. And a lot of requests, like they've been requesting to hear something from you in Arabic, maybe Fedouz or Imkosfil or, or any of those, you know, legends. I said, yeah, but I really don't have experience in that. I've never done it before. I've never even tried it on a guitar. He said, well, how about you give yourself some time? Um, stop writing in English. Stop releasing for the next six months. And that was like a very heavy pill for me to, to to swallow, to be honest, because it was like someone was trying to get me out of my comfort zone. And I was at this point, at that sorry, at that point, I was like, it was like a drug. Like I was very comfortable writing in English, releasing stuff all the time. Um, and so I actually took his advice. I was off for six months. I didn't release anything. And you can tell by the by the releases, you know, on my on my on the DSPs, you can tell that there was like this gap of music like Khalia didn't release anything in such a long time and I came back with a song it's called Kin al that was my first Arabic song it was like a pop sort of soft pop on the guitar and boom and I just sat back and I was like wow why didn't I why didn't I think of this earlier you know I started laughing it's like I told you all you had to do is just try and my parents were very happy and my friends were very happy and I was I was in a shock. I, I, I was impressed by what I did and I was proud and I, I promised myself I'd never stop writing in Arabic. Just because the market clearly wants it or, or because that's the music you want to listen to? Just because I discovered that I'm actually good at this stuff. That's why. Mm, I never knew I could, I could do something like this. And when I saw great feedback, I thought, well, 
I mean, if it wasn't good, Mikey, people would probably say something, right? And I'd but, probably like shelf it or archive it. Or but never is it the music you listen anything. to, though? I feel like it's not the music you grew up listening or that you even like listening to, or is it? I didn't. I definitely didn't grow up listening to that stuff. But after writing that first song, my God, I, you should check my Spotify, man. It's all about Arabic. It's all in the Arabic okay. alternative stuff. Okay, so and it's okay. I mean, people change, and 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 you know, yeah, you start discovering stuff about yourself, and and you know tapping into these things growing up and and you change right as as a human being yeah can we talk about your your first uh, about i think what you might describe as your first hit why right did did you think of that as your first hit yes why is my is my first hit and i i'm always i'm always grateful to why the song the project because it really made my career and it was the song for me, you know, there's a lot of songs that I that I've written before. Why? But why was the first song that was dropped? And I always go back to this song. OK, so you come out with why launches your career. At that point, are you like, OK, خلص, I'm going to this is how I'm going to pay my bills. This is I am a professional musician. No looking back now. Yeah. That sound right? Yes, definitely. That's when I made the decision. So how did you learn the business side of things? Because that's, you know, you don't learn it on the piano. You don't learn it on the guitar. Where did you learn all the business stuff? Because you, you seem like you have the business side, like, locked. I think, I mean, Mikey, anyone, any, anyone can have access to the internet these days, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to go study where I don't know, pay a hundred thousand dollars to to be specialized in music business or music law. I just really dedicated my time for this um, on YouTube. I'd like, no kidding, I'd like watch ten to to twenty videos a day, just understanding things I don't even have to understand. But I didn't want to be in a space where someone would come in and, and take me for a dumbass. You know, honestly, <laughs> forgive my forgive my French, but I I wanted to be the you know the kid in the in the room even though i was 1918 uh, 1920 um in in a, in a in a room with corporate people from a label that were talking stuff you know terminology and i and i i'm proud enough to say i knew what they were saying but you know what's that there's a lot of people like me a lot of talents who seriously feel like they're useless in that room of corporate people in a label music a major label i would say yeah and I don't want to, I don't want to feel that way. And I, I really don't want them to feel that way either. So what I would say is go educate yourself. You have access. It's there. You know, you, you don't need anyone looking down at you and saying, oh, she'd probably not understand. Let her just do her music. Oh, no, thanks. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you, um, you were talking about like being on YouTube 20, 20 videos a day, something I can very much relate to. Um, mm. Who are your go-to OGs when it comes to um, YouTubers who have sort of like set the kind of set the path for you? Like these people are doing it right. I'm following. I'm following their footsteps. They're following other people's footsteps too. But we're all we're all going off some people. Who are the people you look at and you're like, that's exactly my inspo. Um, I'd watch duck documentaries of Taylor Swift growing up. You know, people she would surround herself with. Um, I'd watch Ed Sheeran, uh, you know, focus on his voice and making it on this, you know, tiny guitar that he always carries around. I also watched a lot of, a lot of stuff about country artists, why they'd stop, where they'd play, um, you know, how they build that kind of confidence. And I actually watched a lot of stuff that had, that had nothing to do with music, like entrepreneurs, um, business people, startups. Stuff that would actually help that business side that you were talking about. Um, because that has nothing to do with music. I mean, if anything, it's the boring side. It's the stuff that nobody wants to think about. But it's what brings the money and brings the money in, right? It's what pays the bills. For sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I really consumed all kinds of stuff. Very irrelevant and very, very relevant. Um, and there's a lot of inspiring people out there, right? There's always 
crazy, inspiring people. So yeah. never runs out. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, before we get into some of the interludes, I want to ask you, um, who, who I'm going to ask you to put together another list. Um, when you made the switch into Arabic, did you have some people that you had in mind of like, these are my, in, these are the people that, are, these are the ingredients that I'm putting into the, the salad when I'm like coming up with my own thing? For sure. Um, the first person that really caught my eye was Aziz Mara'a, the Jordanian singer songwriter. I love this guy. I loved, he's like a full package the way he, you know, just plays the music, plays the piano, composes his pieces. It's amazing. Um, he was one of my, you know, very few people that I was inspired by and I, I, and I looked up to. I still do. He's a great guy. Um, he's a good friend. I'm proud to say. There's also the, you know, there's a lot of bands in the, in, in the Middle East. I don't know if, you, if, if you're into that stuff, sure. but there's, a, there's like a new band coming out every single day. And that's amazing because... It's emerging and they're really focusing on alternative music and, you know, changing the scene. I would, I would definitely vouch for um, Autostrad, Murabba, uh, a lot of people from Egypt, Karaki. Uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot, Mikey. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to list all of them, but there's, there's really like, a, like an ocean, <laughs> a lot of sharks in that ocean, you know? Yeah. Do you feel like you're one of them? Um, maybe I'm the, you know, I'm the Nemo. <laughs> I'd like to think of them as the godfathers. Yeah. You know, no matter how, you know, big and, and, um, you know, no matter how big I get, I'd always like to think, um, of them as the godfathers because they really sort of set the path for that. Yeah. I, I gave you such a softball radio. You could have done the baby shark song. <laughs> Oops, my, my nephew loves that stuff. <laughs> yeah, so does mine. Okay, let's listen to the first yeah. interlude and then um, we'll go from there. So for the people who can't see the screen, tell us what the song is and why you chose it. This is Jai Halo. Uh, um, basically translates to what a show off. Uh, it was, it was, it's, a, it's, a pop, it's a typical pop, Arabic pop song, I'd say. It's like very similar to Kilana, the first Arabic song I wrote. So that's like a tribute to the first time I wrote <laughs> in Arabic music. And it's also influenced and inspired by uh, Nancy Ashton's stuff, like the old, very old stuff. And, and, and I'm sure you'll get it. Whoever's listening to the song, you'll, you'll probably get the memo. <laughs> okay, so let's listen to a piece of it. <laughs> stop it here um okay so i want to talk about the songwriting so it starts out with these like these plucks right did you write yeah. it originally you wrote it on the on the guitar yes okay that's right so walk me through how you would write it you're just like you know you're writing like three songs a day doing the ed sheeran method trying to get as many <laughs> bad songs out and hope to find a couple good songs right 
That is right. Are you basically starting with a phrase like, okay, Shaif, Hado, that's a good content. That's a good thing. I'm going to start with a, try to build a character and take, nah, walk me through it. No, Mikey. <laughs> Definitely not. I, because I get, I get asked a lot about this um, yeah. spe specific topic, which is the songwriting process. And I always say it's it's never about creating or fantasizing about a character. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't hear that authenticity in my voice. It is always based on a true story, and I can I can assure you that I've done it so far. Like by far, I've I've written a lot of things about all these people that I encounter in my life. Sometimes it's not about me; it's about someone that is a friend of mine or someone I, I don't know, hang out with. But and I'm not going to promise to do that forever. I'm just saying, like, by far, everything I've written is, is really based on this true person, true being. Um, so basically, songwriting for me is, is it's like humming something in my head and then trying to play it, trying to find the notes either on the piano or on the guitar. That's, that's how I compose. And then I start with the writing, literally. Like I start typing the story down on, on, on my notes. Like this is what happened. I saw this person, saw this guy at a cafe, blah, 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 in English. And then I start translating and start working on the rhythms and, and all the rhyming stuff. But um, they're all like thoughts on notes. That's what I, I learned from the country music. Um, it's really telling the stories like you're journaling every day. And I just start, start you know, plucking out whatever makes sense for the song. But it's all true. I, I trust me, it's all true. I swear. <laughs> it wouldn't matter though if it's whether it's true or not. And maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't to you. But for me, as an artist, that's that's huge for me. For someone to come come at me with, oh, like you're fantasizing about whatever. That's not. No, I'm not. <laughs> but it's so funny. Again, that like maybe I will. It's funny <laughs> that you're like defensively nervous about that. Like some of the greatest stories in the history of humanity, like. Yeah. Never happened, you know? Like, there, there's... Maybe, I don't know. For sure, I mean, like... I'm just... You know, like, there are many fables, <laughs> like, you know, like, Moby Dick never yeah. existed. Anta, you know, like, these, there are fables that, you know, like, there's that, yeah, there's that classic line that something is not, um, that it's fiction, but it's true, right? That's a classic line. And I guess and I guess that's why I never liked fiction and superheroes growing up. Interesting. You know, that's that's really what I'm I think it has a lot to do with my personality as well. Mm. And when someone tries to hit me up like, Hey, we have something coming up, a movie or a soundtrack that we want you to create and I'm like, Okay guys, what is the story about? And th and say, Well, um, this is this is this guy who, who, you know, made it out of war and then he went back to meet his girl his his girlfriend or that person that he loves. And I'm like, okay, but I can't really, I can't relate to that. I need help. I, can you get me a co-songwriter? Maybe we can work together. But I, I'm serious. I, I'm honest about it. Mm. Maybe because I don't like taking my craft for granted. I don't know. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm just saying that's how I do things. <laughs> you know. Very interesting. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So you you saw this guy at the cafe, this hypothetical person, right? Like, um, you saw whoever it was. They struck a chord. You write in your notes. You hum it out, you pull out a guitar, and then you you basically play that original riff and then mm -hmm. and then from there, where does it go? Um, if I have the time, I'd probably sit behind the laptop and start producing the song for seven hours straight and then go to sleep and then come back at it the next morning. If I don't, um I try to look for producers that work on that genre specifically so they can actually do it justice yeah and we just spend hours and hours together back and forth to really reach uh results to, to reach the, the desired result to serve the song literally yeah yeah and then do you have like a, a like a team of producers that you tend to like to work with and then from there does it go to some sort of label or you're just like screw it we're going to upload it like i'm i'm so curious about the hustle afterwards Sure. Okay. So, um, I'm currently not signed to any label. I have a distributor. A distributor is, a, is like a website or an aggregator where you sort of upload your song to, and then they distribute it everywhere on sure. every DSP. DSPs are digital uh, streaming platforms. But before that, what you have to do is to sort of deliver the song two weeks before 
in advance so they can have a listen. It's like a listening party type of thing. Uh, just to make sure it's all clean, nothing explicit, whatever. It meets the guidelines. And then you pick out a date and then the song comes out. But before that, the, the creative process is, yes, picking the, the producer from a group of producers, that uh, a team of producers that I deal with usually. Um, make sure it's all engineered, it's all mixed and mastered. Uh, it sounds good on the, on the headphones, on the car, on, you know, big speakers. And then we're good to go. How do you think about social media? You, you have such a strong social media game. How do you think about engaging your core group of fans and sort of bringing them on this journey? Because you're sort of the main character, right? So how do they, how do you get them to engage with you in that way? How do you think about that engagement? Oof, honestly, Mike, you took me, it took me a minute to really get used to social media. Um, I didn't like it. Growing up, I even though it was literally my time, I think I'm Gen Z, or that's what they say. Um, I didn't like it because I spent a lot of time outside. I'm such an outdoorsy person. Um, but I realized, talk, previously when we talked about business, I realized it's part of that. So I needed to focus on that. I needed to do it for that. Um, despite my desires or what I really wanted. I'm, I'm also very camera shy, so it took me a minute to like get on the story and say, hey, hey, guys, I have a concert coming up, blah, 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 whatever. So it took me it took me a minute and I needed to, to talk about it first to be able to execute it. Finally, um, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of time management as well. So. It, was, it is a game changer for sure. Um, I understand that it's it's a great tool today if, you know, as a consumer, not just as a creator. Um, and I think we should be grateful for it. Right. Nice. Okay. Let's listen to the, let's listen to the second one. Sure. So walk us through what this Cause song is and why you chose it. Cause You Trouble was uh, part of an EP. I named that EP Amygdala. And it's that part of the brain where, you know, it, it just um, controls all, all the emotions and all, you know, melancholic feelings. And that's what the EP was about. It's very mel melancholic. And Albani was actually part of that album. Um, My God's Your Trouble was this, you know, story about me sort of graduating college and um, getting to know people, meeting this specific specific person um, and communicate, learning how to communicate my feelings and explaining to that person, this is, this is who I am, this, that's what I want, that's what I'm focused on. I want a career, whatever. And throughout the relationship, I figured out that that's not okay with them and that I was sort of becoming a dependent, toxic um, sort of person in the relationship. Um, and that's just uh, in a nutshell, cause you trouble. <laughs> when did this come out? 2019. Okay, cool. I guess. Yeah, let's listen to yeah. it. Remember when I told you that I could cause you trouble? You said you don't care and take me as I am For who I really am Take me for my soul, my stiff damn soul
Amazing. I'm going to stop here for a second. Thank you. It has mm-hmm. this um, Adele Skyfall feel to it. And Amy Winehouse a little bit, right? Yeah, it has an Amy Winehouse feel for sure. And then it's like, you don't, it has yeah. that 6 8 feel, gives it this like yeah. Amy Winehouse y vibe for sure. What about Elvis Presley as well? If you go back, there's old tracks. This song, in in your mind, could this have been an Arabic song? I don't know. I, I've never written a song where I was like, oh, let me try that in Arabic. Or let me try that in Japanese. I don't know. Do you speak it Japanese? It comes to me. You know? No, I don't. I'm just I saying. I was going to say, I was like, curveball. I've, I was like, are you huge I've, in Japan? I've and done, I, don't, I don't know that. <laughs> uh, because I've, I've written something in Armenian as well. And I've tried singing in Turkish. Um, I've also tried Indian. But I'm saying like, if I ever had to collaborate with someone from, I don't know, Morocco, it, it, it either you either sort of let me hear the song in that, like in the language, mm-hmm. or it's hard for me to, to, to have me work on something with sort of like, hey, you got to do this on this beat with this accent or with this language. It, it, it just doesn't, I don't function that way. Hmm. I, I should learn how to because that's how you make good collabs. You know, I, I really should learn how to do you know those things because like you said sometimes you, you have to do things when you're giving guidelines because that's just business um but i haven't done it hmm. yet <laughs> yeah do you does it bother you when people compare you to other artists does it bother me like i've been doing um, it this whole time right i've been like this is very this and this is very this and this is very that does it are you like dude no, stop no, it. you're Ah, uh, no, 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 not, not, not when it's, not when it's talked about like this. I mean, I, I would come up to you and say, oh, I created this song last night. It was inspired by, like I did with Shai Palo. Yeah. I, but in, in fact, I take pride in it because they're, they're big artists, you know? Yeah. I'm not going to hide, hide it or try to like, like play big and say, oh, like, especially like now with AI, I haven't tried it yet. I want to, but I hate those people like on TikTok. I don't know if you've seen them. He goes like, oh, yeah, I wrote this song last night, whatever, whatever. And then you go in the comments and you say, man, I tried this too on AI last night and it worked. So it's like, why are you putting yourself in such an embarrassing position? Just say that you did it on AI. It's okay. It's a tool. I mean, it's technology. It's okay to try things and it's okay to be inspired by other people and creators. Not that we can innovate anything, you know, it's yeah. you just make things better. And yeah. Um, but if, if we were talking about comparison as in like, Oh, like you, why don't you have numbers like that person? Or why don't, why, why are your numbers lower than than that artist? Yeah. That bothers me so much. Of course. Why? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just does. It really does. Maybe I should, you know, talk about it with my therapist. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe you should. (laughs) Yeah. I really should. Yeah. But it, it does upset me. Uh, there's this guy, Jalen Rose, and he has a saying that he says, um, uh, can, 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 Jalen Rose. Jalen Rose, he's a basketball player. He's a basketball player and like oh, a media okay. personality now. And just like a very okay. smart guy. Um, he always says, comparison is the killer of joy. Oh, yes. They do. And, and you know what? It sucks because when someone says that to me, my God, I go home feeling so demotivated and feeling like, oh, screw it. I'm not going to make any, like, I'm not going to make music tomorrow or the, for the next two weeks. And I actually, like, I actually stop making music music for the next two weeks, Mikey. It's that effective. And I think that's why I stopped looking at comments on, you know, social media in general, but specifically YouTube. I stopped looking at the comments. I stopped reading anything because I understood how big of a tall it takes you know yeah do you um internally do you have a list of people that you're like i'm trying to be as big as this and and then you have to like shut off those voices like do you have this voice in your head that's like you need to be as big as x y z a b c like these are these and it's not like not taylor swift obviously it's not 
<laughs> you're not you're not saying you have to be as big as Taylor Swift. You have like people who are sort of in your class, so to speak. Um, I mean, as 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 dreamy as it sounds to you, I honestly do consume a lot of Taylor Swift stuff because I want to be as big as Taylor Swift in the Arab world and as big as Adele. That's what I have on my manifestation board. I don't know if it make if it doesn't make sense to you or someone else, but that's what I'm after. Yeah, but and it doesn't make I'm you feel bad around. if you don't have the same numbers as Taylor Swift. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we're talking about um, numbers, I don't know. I, I feel like I don't actually go and, and stalk these artists. In fact, what I do is I send them a message on Instagram and I, and I like try to catch a copy or something. And spe like, especially if they're based in Dubai, what I do is like, I reach out to, I say, I say, Hey, like I've been, I've been like, I've been told that we should meet and we actually go and hit it off and we, we get a coffee and we start talking about music. And then I start, you know, telling them like, what more do you think I can do? And then it's like a sort of like exchange, exchange conversation. So we start talking about music and learn about each other's flaws and whatever, but I try not to keep it in. I, I don't like to have beef or whatever you guys call it. I don't do that. I don't operate that way. Yeah. I think it affects the way I create. So yeah, if there's someone I'm very eager to know about, that's what I do. Like I literally like send a message on Instagram. That's good. That's like a, a super friendly way of approaching it. Yeah. Is there any other way we can approach it? No, but if, I don't know. I don't know. It's not an industry <laughs> that has a reputation as being friendly. Yeah, you know, I heard a lot about that, but it's a, I think it's a misconception because every industry has, you know, a dark side, so, right? So why, why are people pointing fingers at the music industry saying like, oh, this multi-billionaire industry is so toxic. You're never going to make it if you're kind. Fuck off. My God, <laughs> you're going to be kind and, and, <laughs> and also be like really smart, you know? And you know, what's funny. My mom keeps saying that every day. She has to remind me like, oh, mama, like this is, this is really nasty like please be careful i'm like mom it's okay <laughs> i'm okay <laughs> so that's good that's like um the cynics are wrong that can that's what you're saying yeah i guess okay cool um all right let's listen to the third one sure what do we have love it okay so tell that's us it. about this one I think it's such a, it's, it's like, it's like any, unlike any other track that I, I made, it's a collab with uh, DJ Always April, mm -hmm. such a nice guy, so, so talented. Um, he reached out, he wanted to, you know, do something. And I said, you know what? I was just writing a hook and I actually sent him, I sent him that hook. It was very late. It was like 1 a.m. Um, when I sent him that hook, I barely had any words. It was just a hook. It was like a, it's like a melody. And he's like, oh my God, I have the perfect beat for it. And he started, you know, working with it. And in, in a week, we were done with the song and we, we pitched it to TikTok and they loved it. And they said, oh, that's like a very, you know, catchy hook. And we just called it Achenio. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay, let's listen to it.
can I ask you a question? Sure. So when you said you Shoot. pitched that to TikTok, what do you mean by that? So basically when you write something that you think caters to that specific platform. So for instance, TikTok is a very visual platform, right? Yeah. Okay. And whatever is, is whatever you're consuming on TikTok, whatever you're hearing, the sounds are very sort of like they're very short, but also very spot on. Like they're very catchy. Like you can name five TikTok songs right now and you probably don't even know the title or the singer. Sure. So when when we finished that song, we realized Yusuf and I, DJ, um, always April, we realized that the music, uh, this, mm-hmm. the, the sound, yeah. we, we realized this could actually fit on all kinds of videos. If you're like making a, if you're a chef or you're a content creator or you're a stand-up comedian or you're a blogger, travel, whatever. We, we figured that it actually fits all genres of content we should pitch to tiktok and they loved it we actually had a listening party and they loved it and we started bouncing off some ideas like oh maybe we should um pitch it to to dance artists to travel blog bloggers to couples to because you can you could think of a hundred things when i when you hear the like had you clean you could they could literally be singing to your playstation i don't know <laughs> it's like you could really be targeting anything uh so yeah that's it It's interesting. Yeah, because it's like, as you said, it's like, it's one, one stanza and one riff. There you go. You know, it's like a, it's like a, in some ways, it's like a 30 second song, right? Exactly. Yeah. However you chop it up. Yeah. It is a 30 second song. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Is that, do you feel like that's the future of music, essentially, of pop music? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, yeah, I think a lot of things are falling under pop music these days. It's like, come on, guys. Like, anything you come up with is, is pop. You're you're literally, like, degrading pop culture. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Um, I wouldn't what, call this pop. I mean, so pop music, what I mean by pop music, let me just, since I'm asking the question, let me be a little more specific with my own language. What I mean is mm. is popular music mass mass culture okay. popular music right so let me rephrase so, this commercial series. yeah commercial music like literally the same way you just said to me you probably know five of these songs even if you don't know right yeah yeah that to me is what popular music is stuff that's just in the ether stuff that just is floating that's part of the popular yeah. narrative popular culture right so is the future yeah. of pop let me say this again is the future of popular music in the arab world music that's made for TikTok, these 30 second songs? Um, not necessarily because you'd probably also remember a lot of sounds from TikTok that are extremely classical, especially like Hans Zimmer. He trended for, I don't know, two, uh, like like a couple months. The Interstellar, mm-hmm. you know Interstellar? Yeah, of course. Or, or uh, yeah, Hans Zimmer. Uh, what is the other? Yeah, Hans Zimmer. All the Batman, um, all known. the Batman, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, for those who don't know, he's the guy that, you know, composes for big movies. Um, So what he does is not pop, right? It's all popular music. I think if you're talking about uh, popular songs or popular tracks, I would instantly think of Taylor Swift or Justin Bieber. Mm -hmm. But none of that is being used on TikTok. So, no, um, the guidelines that TikTok are following has nothing to do with the genre. It has to do with... um, like a vi- like we said, a very short melody that sticks, that would stick with you, and that w- you would probably whistle or go to sleep with, even you know, mm-hmm. like thinking about. Yeah, it's so interesting. regardless of the genre. Yeah, it's super, super, super interesting. I mean, um, it, you know, I I could be cynical about. It. I can be like the old man on the on the on the porch saying "Get off my lawn!" Right, uh, and mm-hmm. yelling about how tides are changing, but. This is the history of of popular music since whatever the the beginning of the twentieth century. Like technology has always dictated the form. Um, of course, yeah. And so it's interesting to see this uh, this latest iteration. And I wonder if in like five or six years we'll be able to be 
a different version of it, or if this is really going to set the standard of chalas. Like, you know, pop songs, popular music are kind of 30 seconds long. Yeah. I mean, you know what's funny? The, 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 the digital platforms are also changing their guidelines in terms of, like, for instance, like, I have a song called El Acubes. It's four minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, some radios wouldn't want to play that song because it's too long for the guidelines. Do you understand? Yeah. It's like they're honest. They're they're really playing it by they're like going by time. They're trying to like go trendy. So they only play songs that are less than a minute or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not I don't know if that caters to everybody, but if that works, sure. Super interesting. Okay, so before we do yeah. the before we wrap up, um, what are you working on these days? Um, I'm actually wrapping up with my album, the Purple Album. Cool. Uh, the last song is coming out uh, last, uh, I think, end of October. I, I honestly don't know the date exactly, but it's coming out uh, the end of October. Okay. And we'll be done with the album. And then we're going to also finish up some tours. I have a couple concerts coming up. And 2024 is a big year. Amazing. <laughs> Are you somebody, you, yeah. you mentioned your like your vision board. Do you have very clear goals? Like, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. Like objective goals? 100%. Yes. Yes. What do you do? If I don't, I'd probably lose my way. <laughs> okay. So here's a question for you. As somebody who has been, yeah. you know, um, miraculously successful at a young age, how do you deal with failure when you don't hit those goals? Um, the way I picture right now, like I, I'm trying to go back to up to a moment where I felt very, very sad and, and I felt like a failure and like I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't achieve that goal I had on my man- manifestation board. I would, a typical situation would be me driving back to that town that I grew up in and staying with my parents and really just sort of giving in like, you know, just a hug or Something like like my something that my dad would say just to make me feel better, like it's okay, it's everybody goes through these things and, and you can't possibly have like a vibe of success all the time. So that that just makes me feel better. And gratitude all the time. I'm I'm grateful for, you know, every success and every failure. Um <clears throat> it's part of the hustle. And I'm just accepting it, you know. Cool. Okay, let's do the quick Q and A. What are you listening to these days? I have been listening a lot to uh, uh, 1975. You know that band? No, I don't. And it's a pretty cool indie pop. Very slow, very chill. Cool. 1975. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Adele. Anytime. When would, what year would you have liked to shadow her? Or what album? I think most recently. All all these shows that she's been doing in LA. Hmm. Wow. Why, what aspect of her life do you want to see? I just want to see how, like, where does she get that courage and, and confidence? Like, how does she build that confidence, you know, without being an egoistic um you know, son of a bee. <laughs> I just want to understand and learn how you can be so big while also being very humble at the same time. I want to learn that sort of thing. That balance. Yeah. Cool. What do you think people most misunderstand about your work? Uh... I think there's a uh, there's this impression that I I feel like people have uh, that I'm bad at teamwork, <laughs> but I'm trying to I'm trying to fix it. I'm really trying to to work. Like I said, I'm I'm really working on things. <laughs> you're trying <laughs> to you... fix the impression, or you're trying to fix the teamwork. The teamwork, <laughs> definitely me being able to, co- to 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 operate with a, with a team, um, and I think it's um, I mean I blame it on the fact that I literally like grew up like producing stuff and writing and composing and doing all of it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to 
make that better, work with a team. And the last question is, which artist from the past would be your dream collaborator? Elvis Presley, anytime, any day. Really? Okay, interesting. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. people can find you online everywhere. You're killing it. And I'm so happy that you're on the series. Thank you for sharing your truth and your hustle. Um, and Thank I'm you, excited to see see what comes next. Yay. Thanks, Mikey. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you.